I never want to paint people who are pretty. Painting pretty people, it's it's kind of boring, really. You've got to have some sort of. There's got to be hooks in people's face. I don't mean literally hooks, but there's got to be. There's got to be a lot of character. I see people on the tube or on the bus, and I want to kind of go, "Can I paint you, please?" But what you'd have to do is go, "Can I paint you, please?" Because you're unusual, or because you know you've got this great big scar, or because you've got buck teeth, or because you've got wonky eyes, or whatever. And you just can't do it. It's impossible. I'm not tactful enough to be able to approach these people. Though I would end up getting thumped. My grandparents on my mother's side were asylum seekers from Russia who came over due to the pogroms and to avoid persecution they came over and landed in Hull as illegal immigrants coming over here giving birth to simple Yorkshire folk. My grandparents on my dad's side um, were gypsies, um, hence my surname, and um, my grandmother was a bit of a lady of the night or lady of the gin and my granddad, my dad's dad, um, as far as we understand was hanged for murder. It's quite colourful on that side. When I go into art galleries, I'm disturbed by the quality of the work or how narrow in, in how you're not going to attract many people into that art gallery with the work that's on display. There's a very minimal audience for a lot of work. And I'm, I'm trying to be diplomatic here. Um, what's the diplomatic word for shit? I don't mean to be disrespectful of anybody, but a lot of the work I was seeing just didn't do anything for me. I suppose that's what I'm saying. I don't mean it was shit. It, it just, I didn't... It didn't do anything for me as such. Recently, I've started to sketch portraits before I actually do the finished portrait. I, I sketch them, which is really good um, because you get to kind of know people's faces a bit more. It lends itself to the finished portrait, but mainly the reason why I do these sketches, and I do sometimes a dozen for each portrait, because I paint so fast, so sometimes the painting will be over in like 30 minutes. And this is just a way of making it last for another hour. I get very excited when I'm painting and when I'm sketching, so. It just gives me more of a hit. I used to paint a lot at school. Um, I was never really a very good reader. So I used to sort of, rather than read, I used to paint. When I was about 15, I just wanted to draw all the time. So I then became a pavement artist in Hull. So I used to rip photographs out of nature books and things like that and go and draw parakeets or pictures of prints or whatever, or just whichever pop star I was into at the time and draw them on the pavement. And I used to sort of earn a fair whack of money just from drawing on a pavement on a Saturday afternoon. It, well, I say fair whack of money. When you're 15, a fair whack of money is enough to buy you like three pints of cider and a couple of records. So I'm talking that amount of money. This painting is really important. It's my friend Julia who lives in Berlin. I've been trying for a few months to kind of get a style together and didn't really feel confident with anything. And then I did this one. It took about 20 minutes, if that, to paint it. It was kind of a threshold moment, really, because then I started doing the paintings for the clocks exhibition. And you can see that the first painting for the clocks exhibition of Gale is kind of a, a continuation of this one and it was at this point that I knew I was onto something which then became clocks. This is a portrait I did for the clocks exhibition which is my friend Gale, this is one of the first ones I did. Still really pleased with that one. I did this after a Dex's gig in Brighton. I went and got interviewed for the whole art college and never got in. I think at the time art colleges were like for the privilege of the rich and I remember being at the interview and there were lots of people in like Emily Bronte winding sheets and floral dresses and stuff showing paintings of landscapes and sunsets and fluffy bunnies and I was there kind of showing charcoal drawings of Pete Townsend and Paul Weller and Prince. The woman who interviewed me was just horrible and it was obvious that I wasn't going to get in because I wasn't wealthy. This is my learned friend Claire, who's a barrister. For some reason she's ended up being in all of my exhibitions. I always end up painting her. I went to design college and became a furniture designer and moved to London and, and had a, a quite a nice time for the next like 15, 20 years just designing furniture and getting about. I had a, a really comfortable time and did a lot of travelling and just thinking what am I going to do for the next 40 years. And the only thing I actually wanted to do was collect records, which I've done my whole life, and paint, which is something I've done my whole life. That's my mate Steve, who looks like Joe 90 as an indie kid. Um, he won't mind me saying that, because I think that's who he actually models himself on. I was eating a painting one day, I had the clash blaring out, and, she, and I saw her waving at me in the street, and I kind of went, thinking there was a fire or a crash or something, I went, yeah, what's up? And she went, what are you doing? And I says, well, painting. And she went, well, open the door. And then she came in, I made her a cup of tea and painted her. She's a really good friend of mine. I gave her a blender yesterday. I just went between Camden and Soho for six months, buying paint and buying records and then going home and painting them and listening to the record. And after that, 
I, I felt like there was a style and I must have done quite a lot of portraits and stuff in that time and quite a lot of figurative paintings as well, just of my friends. And at the end of it, it felt like there was something there which was usable. This one here is a painting, it's actually self-portrait, but I incorporated a friend of mine who's unfortunately an heroin addict and he kind of looks almost skeletal in his appearance. I wanted to paint him, but I couldn't find him and I thought he'd die. So I ended up painting myself as him. So I got a skull and kind of and painted myself. And so it's actually supposed to be me looking like Peter. And it ended up like that. I did it kind of haphazardly and quickly and just kind of went with my gut instinct on it really. To a lot of people it's really frightening, but I, I, I kind of like it. When I stopped working, it was kind of like retirement, as in I just thought, well, I'm just going to paint now. I'm just going to do whatever I want to do and have an easy time of it. And then you realise straight away that you're not going to have an easy time of it because then you're doing it, instead of working a few hours a day, and getting paid for it. You're working 24 hours a day and not getting paid for it because what you're doing essentially is everything you see and every person you look at and every story that you hear and every news item you read becomes potential to be a painting or to be an exhibition or to be a series of work. And so then you're kind of in the middle of the night having ideas and stuff, which didn't happen when I was a designer. I knew a guy in Sheffield who had his nose bitten off by a dog and I couldn't find him when I come to painting the clocks exhibition, so I ended up again painting myself as him, so I took my own nose off. I met this guy in Varanasi. He had a hair lip and he'd never had it repaired. And he'd ended up his whole life just having this grotesque face due to the, having his hair lip. And obviously when it comes to painting him, I couldn't find him because I'd just met him for five minutes in Varanasi four years ago, so I didn't know what to do. So again, I painted myself as him. So this is me, and then I made myself look like an Indian guy with a hair lip. Um, and it was one of the ones that people really commented on actually because um, it's just quite striking and it's a bit weird and it's one of my favourites from the clock show. And it wasn't just my mates, I mean a lot of other people turned up as well. My mates turned up, they all got really drunk. But it was, there was, it was well attended and I still enjoy those paintings. This is the corner of Mead Street and Dean Street. I've, I've painted a load of portraits that go on this wall in the window reveals. And I chose a load of quite cool actors and actresses, um, like Vicky McClure and Johnny Harris, who were probably best known from This Is England. And it was supposed to go on this wall, but unfortunately, somebody from the English Heritage with a double barrel surname, a woman, then went and stopped it. Um, and Westminster Council, in their late, abject laziness, then said that they weren't going to allow the exhibition to go up solely on Little Miss Fontelroy's blocking. And I was going to paint actors because it seemed that, that I was painting actors and people who operated in their own so And I ended up deciding on the name Windows for this project. And so I painted people, and this is Johnny Harris. He's a great actor and a great bloke, actually, a real gentleman. I expected him to be kind of mean because I've only ever seen him in films where he's mean, like London to Brighton and this is England. And, and he always plays like a bit of a like a not very great bloke, a bit unsavoury. And then you go and meet him and he's a lovely man. Um, and this is Michael Smiley who's been in a few Ben Wheatley films and he's a funny bloke and he, I think he does a bit of comedy. And then also for the same project I played with Vicky McClure who is a, a chum of mine actually, she's the girlfriend of a really good mate of mine and we've become friends. And then um, I painted her uh, a few days before I painted Johnny Harris. And also we went out and went to a bit of a, a do up in Highgate and it was a bit weird seeing them together because on film she bashed his head in. So when you see them together in the same room it was a bit odd. So that project ended up being poo pooed by English Heritage. So that ain't gonna happen. But we'll go forward and I'll get it I'll get it put up somewhere else. It's not an issue. This is a band who are doing really well at the moment called the Sleaford Mods. Great faces as well, so I really wanted to paint them, so I did those. It's gonna end up being with the windows ones as well. Music's always a big thing when I'm painting. I normally have it fairly loud. The music seems to sound better when you're painting and the painting seems to go better when you're listening to music. I, I listen to a lot of Miles Davis, that's a good album in the silent way. So is uh, Live at the Film, oh, that's a cracker. Um, sometimes if I'm getting a bit loud, I put on a load of Sonic Youth because that's a bit balmy. Pavement are good. So uh, the pictures are very good to paint too. Arab Strap, killer. Ziggy live from the Aerosmith Audio. Red Vinyl, by the way. Um, that one's really good. So you can't go wrong with Square Pusher when you're painting. Sign the Family Stone if you want to get a little bit on the funky side. There's no other way of doing it really. You kind of get lost in it and the, it all sounds, it all becomes a bit of an aggregate between what you're doing and what you're listening to, especially when it's sort of screaming at the top of its voice. So this is probably one of the most important parts of my studio. Just get, got to get it in alphabetical order. I then had another idea to do an exhibition about murder. Um, and I was just, I, I started thinking about what's the most extreme things that happen in your life. The conclusion I came to that the most extreme things are your birth and your death. 
and everything that else happens in between is kind of like it's not ever going to be as extreme of either, as either of those two things. One's the beginning, one's the end. And the bit in the middle, it's kind of slush, really, in comparison to your birth and your death. A woman called Janet Charlton, who um, killed her boyfriend by smashing him 20 times in the end with an hammer, then went about the business as if nothing had happened, and then three days later went into a solicitors and told them, but the, the axe was still stuck in her boyfriend's head. It was, a, it was an axe, not an hammer. But it was all very strange. She's now out of jail. I researched about 30 or more murders in, in some depth and one of them was a murder that, in which I was a suspect in when I was 17. I didn't do it. Oh, I swear I didn't do it. And <laughs> I've been completely exonerated. This one must be turned backwards for a reason because it's probably quite gory. Oh yeah it is, yeah, yeah it's gory. Um, this is uh, a painting of a baby with blood on it. There was a girl in Grimsby whose dad killed her mother and her sister and her other sister and then took this girl onto the onto the Humber Bridge and then he chucked himself off the bridge and left her in the car. And that show was all about the subtleties either side of a murder rather than the actual murder itself. That's a picture of my mother, but it doubled up as a portrait for the murder show because I thought she might have looked like a Harold Shipman victim, um, like a bemused elderly woman who's kind of trusting in her doctor and it ended up it was just an excuse to paint my mother. There was only three in that show that had any sort of real gore in them and that was one of them. Each one was a single narrative painting about a moment that had happened within that murder, before or after the murder. This was a guy uh, called Christopher Foster who had killed his wife, his children, his horse and his dogs and then set a light to his old, his, his old farm, this was in Shrewsbury a few years ago. There's no gore, it's a picture of a sad horse. I just sort of imagined a moment within that murder that was a bit poignant and it was the horse. This one is a painting of Meredith Kircher, the girl who got killed in Perugia. I just imagined her uh, kind of just pottering around her room really because the night that she got killed she declined a night out with her friends and just went home and you know did her thing and then the next thing you know she's she's getting killed. I wouldn't say I was worn out with it but I had a bit of brain ache because I'd looked into them all and I'd done it quite intensively for like a couple of months or however long it was and I just wanted to get away. I had the opportunity to go and do an exhibition in Berlin and I had no work for it. All I knew is that there was a gallery in Berlin that I could exhibit in. I hired a massive room and went to Berlin for six weeks and just wanted to paint, well, boobs really. And all I did was paint <laughs> women. I painted boobs. <laughs> I just painted loads of boobs. It was really enjoyable. So in 2013, I did three shows in eight months, which is fair going, but I don't paint slowly and I don't have a problem making decisions about the work. The level of efficiency that I have when I'm painting comes from the level of efficiency I had to have as a professional designer. Having said that, when I used to paint when I was a kid, I used to do it fast as well, so that's just a load of bollocks, isn't it? Yeah, it's a load of bollocks. I've always painted fast. <laughs> I have a heart here. The heart must be from a juvenile, because it's quite small. The hearts are quite a beautiful thing. When you get older on, they're kind of almost like a stress reliever, and they fit in your hand really perfectly. When people heart massage patients in the hospital, they're actually pumping this thing, and it kind of, I don't know, you can even hear it. We throw a lot of things at our heart, and it reacts as quickly, if not quicker, than your brain does. Hence we get phrases like, the, the beat my heart skipped. You know, the heart feels the gravitas of all the mistakes you, you make in your whole life, and it absorbs every one of them. It's a bit like your mother. <laughs> On Valentine's Day last year, I was walking with a bottle of milk in my hand, and I witnessed an argument between a young couple. The bloke said something like, my main regret in my life is that I've got the word useless written across my heart. This thought of somebody having a word written straight across the heart and, and it's, it's that the manifestation of their regret and their guilt and their anxiety and, and their own actions and their mistakes like a callous written on their heart. So by the time I got home with a bottle of milk in my hand, I thought of about 30 words that somebody might have written on their heart and I got it down to six. And then I managed to acquire six hearts um, I can't tell you where I got them from, I've been told by my lawyers, but I managed to get six hearts and a tattoo gun and a load of isopropanol. And so I tattooed the words on the hearts and then I pickled them with the isopropanol and, and the syringes and put them in the jars. But I didn't like the way it looks because they look more like specimens that you'd get in a museum. They weren't as striking as I wanted them to look. And so I painted them instead. And then when I painted them, I didn't like the way they looked when I finished the paintings. And I actually destroyed the paintings because I just, I just didn't like them at all. They, they did nothing. And so then I looked at the reference photographs 
for kind of help really because I needed to melt them and then I realised that the reference photos were exactly what I wanted and they were really stark and really brutal and those photographs I showed to a friend of mine he decided he was going to write like prose for each one like monologues and they started off as poems and then they changed to, to full monologues of the person who, who, who owned this heart as if it was like their, their last wishes, like the last regrets that they had were written on their heart and they were expressing these, these wishes and the, as they were going to hell or to heaven or to wherever they thought they were going. People rubberneck at car accidents because they want to see blood or they want to see somebody in pain or it's unusual to what they normally do now to have it, it takes them away from their normal life. This, it's escapism, but all I try and do is find a way of of, of, of finding a, a narrative or a story in that in order to um, get people to look at it and, in, and, all, and also in order to fulfill my own fascination which is essentially is what I do I do this because I'm fascinated by it or because I want to know about it or because I want to explore a subject and I want to find a manifestation of how this can be documented in an artistic form. Just going into Scramble Sound in Soho, we're recording uh, one or two of the voiceovers for Regrets. Um, I wanted a Scottish guy, I read one of the, read a couple of them through, I just thought it'd be good sounding Scottish and give a good contrast to the other five voiceovers. So, in we go. It's posh, it's posh. So the idea is that this guy has lived all his life and he's not really done very much with it. And at the end of his life, because this thing is called regrets, the end of his life is kind of coming to the conclusion that this is his, the sum total of his life is this, is that he's a waster. So it's not for the, potentially the viewer or the viewer at the exhibition to, to judge this person. It's up to the person who's reading it to be judging themselves. Got you. And take one. Potential. There's a word. They used to say I had an abundance of it. No one says that anymore. Really good. Can can we do it one more time? Because sure. I'm happy with that. Totally happy. But can we do it one more time as if you're absolutely twatted? Yeah, I'll try. <laughs> Take two. This is Neil doing waste of pissed. Potential. <laughs> There's a word. Waste not, want not. But what if you don't want that mundane existence stretching out before you for three score, twenty and ten? And the rest? What then? What do you do? Any ideas? Perfect. Brilliant. Yeah. That was really good. I think we're done. Yeah? That was easy, wasn't it? No Two take wonder. <laughs> <laughs> At this point, this exhibition became like a product. It was photographs. It was sculptures. It was a concept. Plus, it was also sound and audio and acting and music. You could say that this exhibition is going to be all about death. But I always think that by thinking about death, you're also thinking about your life, because death is a very important part of life. By thinking about death and by looking at death and by analysing death and misery and disease and war or whatever else and suicide, you then... I've never felt so alive thinking about death. It's ridiculous. You kind of you think about death so much that you appreciate what you're doing now. You appreciate that you have only got a finite number of days on the planet and you've got to get done what you need done and you've got to have the people around you that you want to have and you've got to be happy, which isn't always easy. By thinking about that you've got a limited amount of time, you're going to squeeze it in. It's a bit like it's a bit like people binge drinking. You know, you've only got till 11 to get really drunk. So people go to the bar and they get really drunk. Well, you know, it, you've only got so many years before you die, so you better, you better fit in what you want to fit in, really. I'm now going to cut this up and have it with a bit of chilli. I'm not really. I am. I'm not. So where did you get these arts from? Because the first thing I saw were these sort of beautiful photographs of what I thought were like red peppers or yeah. engorged strawberries. And then on second glance, you can see that it's actually a real heart. Yeah, well, you, if, you, if you know who to speak to, you can actually get hearts. And people are going to walk in and they're going to be confronted with the, almost like a confession. To see a heart exposed like that, it sort of takes your breath away a little bit, and, and you have to look to see that the word that's on it is quite subtle, isn't yeah. it? And the way you've tattooed it. It's, a, it's, a, it's supposed to look as if it's scar tissue. The, the couple I saw arguing on Valentine's Day last year, that guy's regret was so strong that he was convinced that this word was tattooed across his heart. The 
writers write about love stories and, and, and the heart all the time, but you never think of it as being sort of like a physical, pulsating, ugly thing. It's the central part of your soul. Well, that's the way I think of it, anyway. It's really strange because if, you, if you've got the view, if you're taking upon the viewpoint of someone who is a waster or is a, an abuser, these are all negative things, and, you, and you've got to find yourself looking for the sort of humility in these people, in these characters, not only expressing the regrets but the motives. Do you know what I mean? And especially something like an, an abuser, and, and the, that voice was very sort of like. Um, sneering and, and condescending almost and, and, and nasty and dismissive but as the words came, you know, the words that were truly from the art, you could sense the, the deep and profound sense of regret behind that. And his loneliness. And his loneliness. <coughs> that was the thing, you know, the, the, these, if you live your life like that, hearing everyone about you, you die alone. I've got a friend who works in, in a care home and she says you can always tell the ones who are being bastards throughout their life because no one comes to see them. Yeah. The regrets that you're going to have when you're dead are based upon what you're doing now. The idea with this exhibition is to, is to cause or invite the user or the viewer <coughs> to have some sort of contemplation. Surrounded by the preserved hearts of people past. What would some of these arts say if they could speak? Yeah, indeed. Even in a place like this, it just brings on the... Uh, we basically are bags of meat, aren't we? Do you know what I mean? But, uh, flesh and bone is all we are. And one day we're not even that, we're just dust. Or we're pickled. <laughs> <laughs> I've had the privilege of actually feeling... What does it feel like? Everything it's happens. really heavy and really, it's so beautiful. With a heavy heart. It fits perfectly into your hand because mm. it's asymmetrical. It feels incredible, but it's really weighty. And also it makes little sort of farting noises and stuff like that when you squeeze it. Mm. And it's... And it's actually really strong, you get a real firm, sort of strong, you, your heart squeezes like with the same pressure that you squeeze a tennis ball. Right. So when you think about how hard it is to squeeze a tennis ball, that's what your heart does every second. Then you'll go and tattoo and I go, right. shit head on it or whatever it is you put. <laughs> shit parent. <laughs> yeah, shit parent. And you write about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> on Valentine's Day, do you remember that crushing disappointment when you didn't get in your cars? When you, I mean, I don't care, not, yeah. do you know what I mean, but when you were little. Yeah. Or a teenager, you were devastated if you didn't get a car. I was, I was devastated every year and I still am. My neighbour gives me one. But, um, yeah, that's their regret. Yeah. <laughs> As I was finishing the murder show, I went into a pub down the road called The French House. By the time I'd walked out, I'd agreed to do an exhibition in there because it was their 100th year anniversary. And I agreed to paint some of the locals in there, some of the regulars. So the, the exhibition got called Regulars. The main thing that I learned from doing an exhibition in a pub was never to do another exhibition in a pub because it was just an absolute fucking ordeal from beginning to end. It was August, it was sweaty, it was pissing it down. So the pub was absolutely heaving because you couldn't really stand outside. There's a lot of drinking goes on in that pub. Stupidly, I'd volunteered to do the last painting live in the pub. So I had this young girl who's, who's um, who goes in there sometimes, or oh, now, sitting there being painted uh, with, around these drunkens, and I couldn't stand away from it, and the painting just ended up being shit. Hello, everybody! Hello, 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 hello! Hello, friends, house, hello, hello! Hello, 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 thanks everybody for coming. Uh, I've, I've finished this painting now, so this is de officially declared open. I just want to say thank you to the people who've been painted and the staff at the French House and Leslie. And uh, if you want, want mind just having a toast to all the uh, the war heroes who were in here 100 years ago. So here's to the Batleys. Thank you very much. I was given an exceptional circumstance in that I had this incredible museum, so I didn't want to, I didn't want to do that project by halves. When I first did it, I just thought no one's going to want to see this, and it's going to go in the back room of a pub somewhere, and no one's going to turn up, and it's just a bit macabre, and it's bloody, and there's hearts, and it's about death, and people are just going to go, well, what's this about? And people it was quite initially, some people were quite discouraging about it. And then when I got offered Bart's Pathology Museum, I realised there was an audience and it was worth pushing. And I just, I threw everything I could into promotion and into, you know, making sure it got press and, and it worked. As Valentine's Day approaches, an art installation has opened up which features a different take on hearts. Regrets by Robin Lee. We got stuff on the telly and some stuff in timeout. I was interviewed several times on the radio by different stations. It did its job and I was really pleased about it.
alongside the reality of their own, their own soul. People will be coming to Bart's Pathology Museum, a seat of learning and a seat of knowledge, and they're actually going to be learning about themselves. The last sort of 30 or 40 percent of this exhibition is the thought that people have the morning after they've seen this. It's not necessarily while they're there, because while they're there, they might be shocked. But afterwards, they maybe think about how they conduct themselves. Tell me how much you think this costs. Thank you. Can I have it without the entry? You can. Can I have it? I can give you. Can give, yeah, there you go. We can work this out somehow. We can work this out. We can all do it together. Yeah, yeah. You can have his entry. Otherwise, it looks messy. <laughs> see, I was born in the age of uh, male dominance, the breadwinner, the, the, the king of the castle. Mediocre existence. When things got tedious, I could always liven up the landscape with a well-aimed grenade, or by pulling on the tripwires taut and watching the pathetic people tumble. Where does it say that I have to stay the same? You call me a phony, like it's a bad thing. I was a chameleon. I took him in my arms and said, Oh God, baby, oh please, come on. Why did you lie, he kept saying. Why did you lie to me? I told him. I was permanently slumped against a frame too weak to bear me. And then, that one strong frame finally buckled and broke. So I threw myself against the next one until that collapsed too. I need them both and cursed them for abandoning me. And then I couldn't pick myself up anymore. I'd forgotten what my two legs were for. So here. Yeah. The idea with this exhibition is that for the last like 30% of this is your contemplation. So it sounds pretentious. It's quite hard to not sound pretentious when you're standing in a museum full of people, believe me. So, mate, and thanks very much for coming. Cheers. Somebody came along to the show who was in some manner a representative for the Labour Party and this was in February bearing in mind that there was an election going on in May and I got a phone call from um, from this person a couple of days after the opening of the show saying could I put a piece of art together for a show that the Labour Party or the campaign leaders for the Labour Party were putting together and they'd also approached people like Jeremy Della and Anthony Gormley and a few other people so I was really flattered that they'd involved me and that they'd included me in with those people it's you know the thought that you're going to be sharing a platform with those people two years after you started painting is quite flattering and obviously I jumped at it. it it made perfect sense because I had loads of bloody hearts kicking around in my kitchen it made perfect sense to do it as a continuation almost as like an encore to the regret show so between me getting the phone call and the piece of work actually being finished was about 36 hours um, and it was fantastic it's one of the best things I've ever done um, and it was just this lovely kind of um, full stop if you like on the end of on the end of the regrets exhibition I saw it with my own eyes the sick the hungry the, the vulnerable and the poor Destroyed by austerity and dismissed by a powerful elite who only served themselves. But I convinced myself that I was small and powerless and that nothing I could do would ever really help. I had a heart, but I stopped myself caring. I had a voice, but I didn't speak. I had a vote, but I stayed at home. And when I woke up the next day, nothing had changed. The day after the election, I mean, I think everyone was gobsmacked at the results. Even the politicians involved were gobsmacked at the results. I don't think there was anybody who expected what happened. I had a day off for the first time in months. Um, I decided to just go into town and buy some trainers or whatever and some records and sat around and everybody I saw, that they either kind of was scratching their heads and frowning and going, what happened last night? Or they were silent and kind of grinning um, and he knew that they were the ones who voted the wrong way. 
Um, but you know, democracy happened, and we're, we're just gonna have to put up with that now. But it, I'm, not, I'm not happy about it. I'm currently working on a few different things. Your only remit is to look dead and sexy. Well, I'm so, dead sexy. Yeah. Well, there you go. You, you're almost there already, Steph. I'm thinking of doing an exhibition about suicide. The thought that somebody can want to kill themselves is incredible. And I just think it's that that is um, a subject that's worth tackling. And I want to tackle it sensitively and I want to tackle it with a lot of depth. And also with the respect that the people who decided to kill themselves deserve. By doing this, I'm kind of getting an idea of what the painting's going to look like because some of the shots from down here, this could be a really long, thin, tall painting now, rather than because I was thinking it's going to be wide. It's but, one of the biggest killers of people under the age of 50. You know, when you get people like Robin Williams killing himself and everyone goes, well, why did he do it? Why did he do it? And the, the, you can't understand the, the workings of what's going on in somebody's mind just because they're a comedian. Don't mean to say that they don't go home and they're not racked with guilt or, or they just don't like their lives. You know, we, you get put on the earth um, not through choice. You didn't write a letter in saying, can I be born, please? And can I um, have a life? And that life may be something that you suffer and it may be something that you never come to terms with, the fact that you don't want to be there, and the only way you can see to be happy is to be dead. This woman knew she was going to do this for years. She, she had it in her head that she, that's how she wanted to die. Apparently she had like hundreds and hundreds of teddies around her when she died. I don't think it's morbid. I don't think it, I, I think I'm, by thinking about that, I'm thinking about the good things in life and thinking about using your time responsibly and happily and productively. <laughs> on the phone. I know. <laughs> I don't think if I'd have started painting when I was 25 that the work had been the same. I'd probably have ended up being a graffiti artist or, or something like that. Y you very rarely get a decent 25 year old novelist. They're normally older and there's a reason for that. It's because at 25 they've got fuck all to say. But you say you were this woman right and she so this woman was really highly sexed yeah. and always wanted to look pretty and didn't want to look anything but her best when she was found by mm. the people. We live in a world at the moment where it's all about narcissism and it's all about, you know, um, putting a picture of your salad or your holiday on, on social media and pretending that you've got this life that you potentially haven't got and pretending that life's really happy. I have a feeling that I'm going to do some sort of body of work, if you want to call it that, which is going to be about vanity or is going to be about the different perspectives that people have about their appearance. It baffles me why people buy cameras to take photos of themselves. It's just, uh, it, when I, the first camera I had, I wanted to take a photo of everything, but never, ever, ever did I want to take a photo of myself. But now, every time you turn a fucking corner, there's some twat with a fucking, giving it all this, being absolutely shameless with it as well. They don't care. Is the selfie a modern self-portrait? No, it's an absolute load of bollocks. <laughs> and it's just people pouting into a camera. It's that, it's all that rubbish. If they want to do a self-portrait, they should learn to fucking paint. That's what I had to do. 